and Mandy here with Funding for Good to talk to you today about your board. We have gotten lots of questions this year and actually we're getting ready to have a new release of the website. Lots of updates, lots of new programs, and we're going to have lots of new things for board development. So be on the lookout for that. We're going to do some emails and promos so you know when that comes out. But today we're here to talk about is there such a thing as too small? Get your mind out of the gutter. We're not talking about that. We're talking about your board. Is there such a thing as too small in your nonprofit board? And the answer to that is yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely there is. So how do you know what is the right amount, for the right, number. right size mm -hmm. for your board members? And it might be different when you start your organization than when you've been around for five or ten years. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But it, can you have one board member and that be enough? Can you have two board members and that be enough? And the answer to that is no to both. So we're gonna let Marie talk to you for just a second about the purpose of your board and why you need more than two board members. And um, we are really looking forward to some questions. So if you wanna ask questions in the comment section, we're, we're happy to do another recording later to address them. All right, so for those of you who are new to the Funding for um, Good vlogs, or maybe you just missed some of the prior board vlogs, we've talked a lot about the fiduciary duties, which are the legal duties of a board of directors of nonprofits. And essentially there are three of those. One is the duty of care, and that means board members are gonna make informed decision in the best interest of the organization. Two is loyalty, that individuals on the board will act in the interest of the organization and put their loyalty, um, give their loyalty to the organization and put it beyond and above their own interest, conflict of interest, those things. And finally, the third in fiduciary duty is duty of obedience. And that is the board's way of saying we are going to govern according to our bylaws and approved policies and procedures. That being said, board members are considered fiduciaries, which means they are legally responsible for the organization and they have to make informed decisions. There has to be consensus. The IRS, our government, does not give nonprofit status to an individual. Nonprofit exempt status or exempt status is given to an organization and in order to have a full organization, you need members of a board. What happens when you have two board members and there's a deadlock. How can there be consensus? How can there be, you know, if you vote on something and you just can't agree, how do you break that vote? There's, it's impossible with two people. Or if you just have two board members and one of them doesn't show up for a board meeting, how do you have a quorum? You can't. So two is definitely not an appropriate board number. And someone might say, well, what about three? Because when you get more than two or three people in a room, it's hard to form consensus. Absolutely. But your organization exists to serve the community as a whole and to do things that is not possible for one person. So obviously, the more committed, dedicated, organized individuals in your group, the better. Now, there is such a thing as too large as well. Oh, uh, yeah, um, there is. But, sure. so we've gone from two, that doesn't work, three. You say, okay, well, three, there's the tiebreaker. Once again, how many of you have a 100% board attendance at all your meetings? Probably not many of you. So if you have three board members and one misses, once again, you're at a deadlock. Once again, difficult to have consensus. You risk the possibility of two people kind of ganging up and teaming up against the other. So you're really, it. the dynamics are not productive for constructive conversations, dialogue, and consensus building. And then when you have, we get into more things like board roles. You know, a lot of organizations have a treasurer, a secretary, a board chair, a vice chair, and there's a reason for that. Additionally, you typically have board um, term limits because you want to have several classes on your board so everybody's not rotating off at once. Because if everybody rotates off at once, then who's going to be the mentor for the group that's coming in? How are they going to learn anything? Absolutely. And some people are like, oh, our board members have been on there for 30 years. Again, that is a huge red flag and not a best practice. Bylaws exist for a reason, and more than likely your bylaws say you have to have a certain number of board members and they serve for this period of time. So if you don't have enough board members to keep some folks on that know the history, that know the policies and procedures and can train new board members or mentor them, then you're starting fresh all the time, which means you're not really building a robust organization because you're always in an infancy stage of training people. And absolutely, and running a nonprofit, for those of you who are in the mix right now, you know nonprofits are messy, they're not easy, it's a lot of work. So they say more hands make lighter work, you need more people actively working. So some people say, but we have a governing board, we're not an, a working board. Technically, whether you're governing or you're a working board, you should have active boards. That was another blog topic that we've covered. But every board member should be active, which means they should be contributing to um, the resources of the organization, helping secure resources so that your mission can be fulfilled. 
So one, you need board members so that you can have act, um, active board members to be able to fulfill fundraising, resource development, um, leadership trainings, all the things. And what about succession planning? Succession planning is huge. Um, the board of directors is responsible for hiring your executive director, um, also for bringing in the new leadership on the board. So when you have one or two people and they've got too many irons in the fire, are they really gonna have the time to identify, recruit, train, mentor those new people? And when we get into a lot of people wanna know about effective fundraising with your board and you only have two people, then how many people do you have contributing to your organization outside of donors, right? Because foundations will ask what percentage of your board give financially. You wanna be able to say 100%, but when you only have two board members listed, that's not so impressive. So, you know, additionally with fundraising, we do lots of prospecting with boards. So if you only have two board members and you say, hey, everybody give me a list of five people or businesses or corporations you feel like might be interested in supporting what we do, you have a list of 10 people. When you have eight board members, now you have a list of 40 prospects. So, you know, there's, they, the board is responsible for helping with some of the work. Let's say you're doing a special event and your board members are required to volunteer. There's a big difference between having two volunteers for a special event and having eight, right? Absolutely. And you, um, we talked about this last week, but if you are expecting to be competitive in grant processes and cycles, one of the key questions you're gonna be asked is about your board. And, well, several key questions. One is, how is your organization governed? And obviously you will say board of directors. Many times they will say how many members are, or individuals are on your board of directors, and you have to state that. How many of those um, contribute financially? You will have to share that. And almost in every application for anything over $1,000 and most every application we fill out, we have to upload a list of all the board members that includes maybe their ethnicity, their professional background, their geographic location because donors are looking for um, diverse boards. That are representative of your area. Absolutely. And can two people really represent the entire area in which you live? Maybe if no. you're in a remote corner of Alaska, but for most of us, no. And donors are saying, we want to invest in your success and your impact and they're looking at the capacity of the organization to succeed. So just like if you go to the bank and you ask for a loan, they're gonna say, are you currently working? You know, what is your income? And they're gonna ask all these questions to determine if, if you are going to be a safe investment for them. Donors do that with nonprofits and they say, okay, this organization has a robust leadership on the board. There are five, six, seven, eight, nine active board members, that's great. But if you come in with a number that's too low, and they say, wait a second, if one or two people drop off, this organization has no governing body and is at jeopardy of closing their doors. So donors see tiny boards as a huge red flag. This hopefully, adores, tiny boards as a huge red flag. It's been a long day. <laughs> so hopefully this has been helpful. Hopefully you've learned some information about why your board can be too small. Maybe the next time we'll talk about, is there such a thing as too big? And the answer there is also yes. Hope you have a great day. Keep growing for good and we'll see you on another vlog soon.